Hi, and welcome to my talk, See Your Capsids Leak and Pop, AAV Genome Ejection and Capsid Stability on Uncle. If we think of AAV as a pinata, the DNA is candy, the capsid is cardboard and colored paper, then this is what a thermal stability experiment looks like. Uncle is the broadsword wielding warrior who is wasting no time seeing what this capsid can withstand. Meanwhile, gene therapy researchers are there in the background, cheering on the experiment and excited for the results. In the world of viruses, lots can go wrong, but in viral stability, let's take a closer look at two questions, aggregation and virus capsid stability. Knowing the answer to these questions is key to optimizing capsid design, formulations, process, and storage conditions, since you want to deliver an answer that keep your, keeps your virus in the best possible condition for the longest time possible. You could also ask if stability problems are the underlying reasons for potency, purity, or immunogenicity issues. Current techniques for answering these stability questions take time and sometimes a lot of sample. Functional infectivity and potency assays require highly skilled personnel working through timely cell-based assays. There is need to get data on viral stability in a few hours with low sample requirements to quicken the development process and simplify the required assays. That's where UNCLE comes in. UNCLE is an all-in-one stability platform built for biologics. It uses two lasers to excite either label-free protein intrinsic fluorescence or a variety of dye-based fluorescences. With full spectrum fluorescence detection, UNCLE can pick up both kinds of signals from either proteins or dyes. SLS is the scatter light from those two lasers and it gives information on what aggregates form. DLS is dynamic light scattering and allows for detailed measurements of size and size distribution. These three detection methods can be operated isothermally at room temp or across a heat ramp designed to thermally stress samples and see which ones can take the heat. UNCLE is able to deliver results in aggregation with two, at two different looks at viral capsid stability in about two to three hours with nine microliters of sample for up to 48 samples at a time. So that makes, brings us to the uni, which is what makes all this possible. And it helps make UNCLE truly unique because it provides high throughput and a small sample size. Uh, each uni is 16 quartz microcubets uh, that hold nine microliters of sample. Uh, and then they are enclosed within a two silicone seals, making sure that the sample uh, is sealed tight and is not prone to evaporation or leakage. It can actually be frozen and placed in the actual uni itself. But in this case, uh, we actually close the uni around the sample and then we load it onto uh, the heating element of the uncle, uh, where we can run from one to 48 samples at the same time, and use whatever we don't wanna uh, load later. Now the uncle's ready to test out AAV stability. So let's take a look at what it's gonna be used for. So with AAVs on uncle, fluorescence can be used to measure two different behaviors for capsid stability, either first shown on the left, uh, proteins unfolding and capsid disruption occurring as a result, or lower shown on the left, genome ejection occurring from capsids. We'll look at data both from the literature and from UNCLE to demonstrate these behaviors. With UNCLE's SLS and DLS capabilities, we will also be able to identify when aggregation occurs, either at time zero before an experiment from DLS or during a thermal ramp from SLS or even during a thermal ramp from DLS as well if we design the experiment differently. So the first question to address is, how do we know that AAV capsids have two different options for stability issues? Well, we can take a look at this paper by Bernal. Here we have AFM measurements on uh, AAVs eight and nine while heating. You can see linear DNA molecules uh, that are ejecting from intact capsids, which is a result of that genome ejection pathway shown earlier. At the top of the slide, we actually see intact AAV capsids shown as bright white disks in the middle we'll see those linearly ejected DNA as the sample gets heated up and DNA is escaping from intact capsids. And at the bottom, we see relatively intact piles of DNA that are left behind after capsid disruption occurs. Uh, I like to sometimes call this the Death Star exploding and leaving behind a pile of DNA. So how can UNCLE help figure out that stability? Well, using intrinsic fluorescence, UNCLE can excite the AAV capsid proteins with its 266 nanometer laser uh, and look at the fluorescence from the tryptophan and tyrosine residues to monitor when capsid protein unfolding occurs. Here's a look at the raw data for that. 
Uh, in this case, we see the SLF result from that 266 nanometer light scattering. And then we see protein intrinsic fluorescence between about 300 and 430 nanometers. As the sample temperature increases, Uncle continues to take a read. So each line of this graph is an independent temperature read. Uh, when temperature goes up, signal intensity drops and shifts to the right, called a redshift. Uh, the blue arrow in this graph is meant to guide the eye to this redshift, and it's helped by the dashed blue line shown in the true vertical. This redshift is because the uh, hydrophobically enclosed amino acids are being more exposed to aqueous environments, and so their fluorescence shifts to the right, towards the red. If we analyze that intrinsic fluorescence peak for the spectral center of mass, also known as the barycentric mean or BCM wavelength, we'll see that that spectral center of mass also shifts upward to higher numerical values of wavelengths in that redshift moment. So in this case, we can identify that by looking at uh, the inflection points in that BCM curve. So we see a BCM uh, inflection point at 78 degrees Celsius. So that's where we've labeled our TM or our melting temperature for this experiment. Uh, the Tiansa is when that slope starts to increase. So that's when the proteins of the capsid are unfolding. If we overlay uh, that data with SLS data in green from the 266 laser, we can see that aggregation behavior and unfolding onset line up at the same temperature, about 74 and a half degrees uh, Celsius. If we want to compare that value to the literature, uh, where you know, we're looking at protein unfolding behavior exclusively, we can take a look at this paper by Bennett. In this case, we're kind of investigating the, uh, the question of, can I do anything about this pro protein unfolding and aggregation? Well, in this paper, a variety of serotypes and buffers were looked at, and across the board, uh, almost all of them have a melting temperature at 70 degrees Celsius and above, with maybe three exceptions in AAV serotypes two and three in certain buffers. So this is a pretty nice rule of thumb that we can use to understand when protein unfolding and capsid disruption occur, but it's also nice to know that each serotype will have different uh, unfolding behavior based on its sequence, and then buffers also have an impact as well. So there's both a capsid engineering and selection question that can be addressed with this, as well as formulation questions. If we compare UNCLE's results to, that, to those results by Bennett, uh, we have an idea of how that intrinsic fluorescence data matches up with that dye-based fluorescence uh, used in, that, in the literature. So here we're looking at AV serotypes 1, 2, and 9 that have dramatically different intrinsic fluorescence melting temperatures. And you can see the differences across the serotypes uh, both at the top and shown at the bottom of the table. You can also see in the table the comparisons between the UNCLE data and the Bennett data line up very nicely. And then any differences can be attributed to using a dye versus intrinsic mode of fluorescence or differences in the buffer. So let's switch gears and look at genome injection. In this case, we're going to use a dye to help us visualize uh, when DNA injection is, is occurring in capsids, or in other words, when DNA release is happening. So UNCLE will use its 473 nanometer laser to excite cybergold dye, uh, and the resulting fluorescence from that dye will tell us how much DNA is present in the solution. At the start, cybergold has low fluorescence while the genome is inside the capsid, but any free DNA may be fluorescing. And then as the capsid is heated and releases DNA, uh, that cybergold fluorescence binds and outputs a high fluorescence signal. And the temperature where dye fluorescence increases is the stability readout. So here's a look at the raw fluorescence data seen on Uncle with Cybergold. This is the same concentration of AAV9 that we saw earlier, uh, but this time we've added Cybergold and we're using the blue 473 nanometer laser. So in this case, we can see that the dye's fluorescence is in a different part of the spectrum between about 500 and 650 nanometers. Uh, we also see an SLS peak at 473 nanometers. And in this experiment, only that blue 473 nanometer laser is used so that's why there's no intrinsic fluorescence or SLS spectrum at 266. As temperature increases, uh, we'll actually be merging the area under the curve in this case, and the area under the curve will generally increase. Here's a look at the results. So in this case, uh, we're seeing an initial fluorescence readout at 25 degrees Celsius as representative of the amount of free DNA that we have in solution. As we heat up the sample, that fluorescence decreases, which is the result of a relationship between temperature and cybergold fluorescence. Uh, 
That's something we can easily look at with DNA and dye only controls. Uh, the headline of this experiment, however, is at about 50 degrees Celsius when the cyberglow fluorescence starts to increase, uh, leading to an inflection point at about 58 degrees Celsius. So this is showing the ejection of viral DNA beginning at around 50 degrees Celsius with that inflection point at 58. Uh, that continues until about 74, 75 degrees Celsius, where we again see aggregation as indicated by the SLS of the 473 nanometer laser, uh, which agreed very well with the intrinsic fluorescence and SLS data that we looked at earlier. So here we have in one experiment, DNA release and capsid aggregation information that we can use to investigate capsid stability. If we wanna compare that across different uh, concentrations of AAV9, we can see here between 5E11 and 1E13 VG per mil, uh, very nice consistent genome ejection behavior. And actually we can go up even higher to 1E14 VG per mil, uh, but doing so kind of compresses all the data. Um, so any concentration dependent effect that we can see is, is minimal. And serotype also changes everything with genome ejection behavior. In this case, we're comparing AAV9 that we've seen uh, to AAV2. And, and we're seeing an eight degree shift in melting temperature behavior with AAV2 having an onset temperature of about 37 degrees Celsius. So at the bottom, I've also put the uh, temperatures from the unfolding melting temperature from uh, the intrinsic fluorescence, the genome ejection temperature shown in the graph, and the aggregation temperature using the blue laser. And you can see that the difference between the two serotypes is not a consistent value, so we can't just measure one of these and extrapolate. We have to actually measure each of these different behaviors to fully characterize our, cap our capsids. So we want to take a quick look at formulation impact on these behaviors. Uh, here we have an experiment where we've started with a, uh, a AAV9 in a PBS buffer. We've added a high concentration of arginine uh, to really show the impact that formulation can have. On the left, we have intrinsic fluorescence data, which is telling us that our capsid proteins are unfolding in the presence of high concentrations of arginine, which is expected. However, on the right side of the slide, we see we have our cybergold fluorescence data. We can see that the high concentration of arginine also decreases the stability by genome injection, which is kind of unique and novel results. So that's how we can know that excipients can impact both stability behaviors of uh, AAV capsids. So from that uncle data and from academic literature, we can see that these two behaviors occur at different temperatures, with genome ejection actually occurring at temperatures far below capsid disruption. So that's why measuring viral stability in uncle is so important. They can look at both of these pieces of data and capture aggregation data as well. And each of these pieces of data does vary with serotype and formulation. So We've cracked open that AAV pinata that I kind of led with. Uh, now I want to show you what other benefits using uncle to attack those AAV pinatas can offer. So in this case, we're looking at uh, a dilution series where we're tracking that initial fluorescence intensity. So here, that initial free DNA uh, correlates with the amount of free DNA, that, or that initial amount of fluorescence intensity correlates with the amount of free DNA that we have in our sample with a pretty good CV. So that's also interesting because if we look at the final DNA uh, sample, the final DNA result, our fluorescence intensity continues to be linear with tighter of DNA. Uh, so that kind of indicates to us that we can look at both the final and initial DNA result present in the sample and have a pretty good uh, precision with that as well. Since we also do DLS uh, reads during our capsid stability runs, we can get information on if your capsid during this experiment started as a homogeneous monodispersed capsid or if it had, was suffering from aggregation issues already at the start of it. Uh, you can also confirm at the end of the experiment that uh, sample aggregation has occurred. And then by using our particle intensity uh, from our DLS reads, we're able to help look at capsid tighter as well. So particle intensity is gonna be the light scattering intensity uh, related to the light scattering intensity that comes off of an AAV uh, sample and it's gonna correlate linearly with concentration. So in this case, we're showing a sample uh, where we've built a standard curve on the left and then the right, we've used that standard curve to take a look at different unknown concentrations of capsids and use those to calculate concentrations. So in this case, we have an R-squared value of about 0.99, and we'd be pretty happy with this 
uh, with this assay for using these uh, standard curve samples to, to build that standard curve, excuse me, the standard AV capsids to build that standard curve and then use that standard curve to understand what our concentration of un unknowns is. So let's look at how we can see more AAB stability behavior with Uncle. Using Uncle's two lasers and full spectrum fluorescence, we're able to look at both pathways of AAB stability, the genome ejection and capsid disruption pathway. And its DLS was able to look at sample quality before thermal ramp and is another quantitative measure of aggregation. And its particle intensity and cyber gold fluorescence metrics are useful tools to look at capsid count and DNA on the same sample. And importantly, most of this information actually is available in only one experiment using only one nine microliter volume of sample. So now with all of this UNCLE data, we can create an AAV that's ready for battle and won't aggregate or fall apart when under stress. And now I'll ask, so what questions do you have for me?